Hello guys, welcome back to another video, and today we are going to be doing a deep dive into pretty much the largest member of every, or at least pretty much every main group of animals. And we're only doing prehistoric creatures this time. We're doing the largest prehistoric animal from each of these groups. Not including modern creatures. This, honestly, the modern creatures wouldn't really apply for most of them. Though there are some, like a few of them, where modern creatures are a little bit larger than their prehistoric relatives. Though, for the most part, the prehistoric animals are significantly larger. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this beginning part since this is going to be a very long video since we have quite a few creatures to go through. Over 170, in fact. So, um, yeah, I recommend you get comfortable because we're going to be here for quite a while. Anyways, I do want to also mention that, again, the size estimates that we're going for may be a little bit questionable. I guess I know I'm definitely going off of some of the higher estimates for a lot of these animals, though they may be a little bit stretched from time to time. Though, again, I am going to try to keep it as reasonable as possible. Though, again, I apologize if I get any information wrong. Just let me know down in the comments if there's anything you see that's incorrect. But, um, yeah, anyways, let's jump into this video. First off, we have the largest crinoid, which was Cyrocrinus cubang. I can't even pronounce this full scientific name. We're just going to call it Cyrocrinus. And this, there was a specimen of this animal with a stem that reached 85 feet long. Just the stem of this animal. Not including, like, the actual fan part, though. I'm assuming it wasn't... It was definitely large, though nowhere near as large as its absolutely massive stem. This animal is from the, well, um, early Jurassic, and, well, most of them were only a bit taller than a man, which is already massive for a crinoid. The apparently, some of the mo largest ones could have reached 85 feet. And, at least from what I can tell, they would have attached to... They were not one of the free-swimming crinoids. They would have actually attached to things like the seafloor and other floating structures and grown based off of that. In fact, I believe these ones would have grown upside down on floating, pretty much attaching to floating marine organisms and kind of structures. Anyways, moving on to the next prehistoric animal, we have, I believe, a relative of arthropods. I don't believe it's an actual true arthropod itself, and it's from the Cambrian. This is the largest organism from the Cambrian period, and, it, and you may be familiar with it. It is the Omlidens amplus, which was a giant marine organism from the Cambrian period. Period again, like I said, it would have reached almost five feet in length and would have basically fed on small organisms on the seafloor. Unlike what we used to think Anomalocaris would have done, where it would have, um, again, we originally believed that um, Anomalocaris would have, like, pretty much swam above the seafloor hunting small animals off the ground, though more recent research suggests that Anomalocaris would have actually went for more um, open-bodied, an like, animals swimming more in the open body of water, and that were usually softer, while this creature would have most likely sifted through the seafloor. Speaking of Anomalocaris... Moving on to the largest radiodont, Agiracassus, from the Ordovician, is a relative of Anomalocaris, though is very different. This animal reached a little over six feet in length and was a giant filter feeder, feeding off of feeding from tiny organisms from the Ordovician Sea. And I believe it was one of the later radiodonts, since I believe the Ordovician is as far as they actually would have survived to. Anyways. Moving on to the largest arthropod and the largest Eurypterid, Jackalopterus. This animal was absolutely massive and measured in at around 8 feet in length and lived during the early Devonian. This was easily one of the largest Eurypterids ever to live and easily the largest, um, the ar largest arthropod to ever live on Earth. This thing was just absolutely massive, though there were a few other arthropods that did get very close in size to it. I believe this was the largest, even if it's not, it's by far the easiest, the largest Eurypterid. We also do have another arthropod, Hypertops, which was, I believe, from the um, Carboniferous, if I'm not wrong, which I believe it also, we actually know, it was from the Devonian and Carboniferous. And um, it actually would have ventured on land, likely. It was also very heavy. I believe that it also did um, rival in size with um, your um, Jackalopters, which Jackalopters was significantly larger, but I know Hibertops was very heavy. And Hibertops would have measured in at about five or six feet long. So it was also a extremely massive animal. Now moving on to the first, well, group of three, we have Palmoscorpius, Brontoscorpio, and Prearcturus. 
and all of these scorpions or at least scientists do believe that they are scorpions though i know their um relation is kind of debated but a lot of people do place them as actual true scorpions and all of them were about the same size and all absolutely massive being i believe two to three feet long these things were all carnivorous and I believe Palma scorpius itself was venomous, and I believe the other two also were possibly venomous as well. Though, again, we cannot be so certain completely on how venomous they were. Those based off, if we're going based off modern scorpions, seeing that they have kind of smaller pinchers and larger um, stingers, they were likely decently venomous, if they were venomous at all. And they all lived, well, at least Palma scorpius and the others are all from the Paleozoic era. Palma Scorpius was from the Carboniferous, while Bronta Scorpius and the other one were from the Devonian period. So, and actually, yeah, I believe the Devonian, if I got that wrong, I actually could be wrong. I think Bronta Scorpius may have been from the um, Silurian, actually. I, again, I apologize for that, but um, yeah, these were all absolutely incredible animals. Now, moving on. We have Istophosaurus, specifically the species Istophosaurus rex was the largest trilobite to ever live. It measured in at about 24 inches or two feet. And well, it was again, a massive animal and lived during the Ordovician period. It was likely preyed on by sea scorpions or Eurypterids as, the, as they're more properly referred to. And again, they were a pretty generic or normal looking trilobite, but they were able to reach massive sizes. I know there were a few other trilobites that also could have approached similar sizes, but Astosaurus rex is generally considered the largest. Moving on to another arthropod, I believe the longest and largest terrestrial arthropod, if I'm not wrong, or at least the largest millipede relative, Arthropleura. It was, of course, a massive herbivore, measuring in at around six to eight feet, if I remember correctly, and it would have basically, um, basically would have fed on decaying matter from the floor and other, um, other plants and such, and it lived during the Carboniferous period. And only recently we actually found the head of this animal, so we were able to figure out more about its feeding behaviors and other things about it, and also its relation to millipedes and centipedes. It was not a true millipede, and it was also not a centipede either, though it was more closely related to millipedes. Anyways, moving on, we have the largest ant, being Titanonerma giganteum, which was a absolutely massive carnivorous ant from the, um, I believe, Eocene of Germany. You may remember this creature from Walking with Beast, where it's, well, pretty much its most infinite appearance, and if you know, it's definitely, definitely for sure a carnivore. And, um, of course, the um, females would have been larger than males, and they would have measured in at about two to three inches long, which isn't long, not too big, but for an ant, that is absolutely massive, especially for a carnivorous one, which would be absolutely horrifying to um, run into. A lot of large insects and arthropods came from the um, Paleozoic, though, of course, Titanoderma giganteum from the Eocene is from after the dinosaurs in the Cenozoic, though pretty early on in the Cenozoic. Now, moving on, we have another close relative to ants. The Woodwas East Pesterosterex, I believe, is how it's pronounced. It's a mouthful of a name and it was a absolutely massive wood wasp being around like three to four inches and pretty much fitting in the palm of your hand which for a wasp is definitely large and very 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 concerning in size like Titanonerma, this animal was also from the eocene though unlike you know, Titanonerma being from germany this one was from north america Next, we move on to another absolutely massive insect named Gigantitan, which honestly sounds like it should be the name of a dinosaur, but like a lot of prehistoric or just animal names, of course it was taken by an insect. And this was actually a relative of crickets, locust, and, um, and, uh, yeah, crickets, locust, and I, I, why can I not remember that last group? It, again, crickets, locust, and grasshoppers. All of those are what is more closely related to, despite the animal looking pretty similar to a praying mantis. This animal lived back in the Triassic period, well, actually I'd say pretty early on in the Triassic period, probably predating or around the same time as earlier dinosaurs. And um, yeah, anyways, this thing would have measured in at around 16 inches long, so yeah, you can just imagine how massive this insect is. Next, we move on to the griffin flies, which are very dragon-like, dragonfly-like animals, and they were somewhat related to dragonflies, though they were part of their own group. And the largest two griffin flies being Meganeuropsis and Meganeura, 
both of them being absolutely colossal and living back in during the Carboniferous era. And scientists have kind of debated on how insects from this time in general were able to get this big. A lot say oxygen and some say lack of predators, probably a combination of those things and maybe some other factors. But um, yeah, these things would have been carnivores. They also would have been similar in size to a cat and each one of their wings would have been 13 inches long. So again, absolutely massive. They would have preyed on smaller animals, probably smaller insects and small reptiles from the time, and probably even some smaller amphibians as well. And um, yeah, these things would have been pretty interesting, especially since they're very dragonfly-like, though definitely more distinct. Anyways, moving on, we have Mesotyros, which was a giant Paleodicteropteran, which was another group of giant flying insects, except in this group, just like the griffin flies, are completely extinct, though they were somewhat, somewhat related to the griffin flies. And this animal would have measured in at about 22 inches in like the wingspan. And um, yeah, it was smaller than the giant griffin flies, though it was still a absolutely massive flying insect. Now we move on to, well, a little bit less of the arthropods, and now we start to move on to the mollusk with the giant snail, Camptonile, which was absolutely colossal, measuring in at around 35 inches with just the shell itself, and probably even bigger with the actual flesh part. But um, yeah, this animal would have lived actually after the dinosaurs, back in the Eocene. And I believe it actually lived past the Eocene as well. And this was, a, again, a giant aquatic sea snail. And it probably would have fed on decaying matter that was on the seafloor, like many other marine snails. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what we have to say on this creature. Moving on, we have giant bivalve Platyceramus, which was basically just a, an absolutely massive clam. This thing, when I say it was absolutely colossal, I sure do mean it. This thing would have measured in at possibly over nine feet in diameter, or at least across the shell, which for a clam is absolutely colossal. And um, I know there were a few, this are a little bit of higher estimates for this animal. And I know there are a few other ones that could have also gotten very massive from this same family group. This animal also lived during the Cretaceous and of course was fully aquatic. So, um, yeah, again, it probably was also a filter feeder like most of our bivalves, but, um, yeah. Anyways, now we get to finally move on to what most people would start to consider the more interesting stuff, the cephalopods. Starting off with the giant nautiloids Indoceras and Camaroceras. Both of these animals would have measured in at similar sizes, though most scientists agree that Indoceras would have been the larger of the two. And generally, these animals are considered to have a shell length of around 18 feet, though there are some estimates saying that they could have reached all the way up to 30 feet with just a shell, not even including like the head and tentacles and arms. But granted, the 30 foot estimates are definitely more questionable and 18 feet are definitely more of the um, reasonable ones that most people consider. These animals would have lived back in the Ordovician period and probably were the top predator. And, of course, a lot of people are probably familiar, especially more with um, Camera of Sarah, just with its appearance from Chased by Sea Man Monsters and a few other documentaries. But generally, this was definitely a very interesting group of animals and honestly, definitely one of my favorites. Next, we move on to another shelled cephalopod, a actually, in fact, a giant ammonite being one of, if not the largest ammonite, I believe. And at least from what I can find, and most people consider this one to be the largest ammonite, it is the Parapuzoja, which was a, again, a massive ammonite that would have lived in the Western Interior Seaway and other parts of ocean around North America during the late Cretaceous. This animal may have been fed on by large mosasaurs, especially when it was younger, though definitely would be having a tough time hunting this animal once it was a full-grown adult. Considering this animal's shell could measure up to 11 feet across and again that's not even considering the head and this animal was definitely not only very large but also likely would have been very very heavy and i have seen that this animal would have if the shell was uncoiled like the um, giant nautiloids it probably would have surpassed them significantly but anyways next we move on to a giant belenite megatuthis which this animal, just like the other cephalopods, were most likely carnivores, and this animal is from the early Jurassic period. 
Some estimates say it could have measured up to 7 feet or even 10, though I have also seen some smaller estimates of around 6 feet. But again, Bellinoids, Bellinoids did not get as big as I would expect them to, but this animal was probably the largest of them. Next, we move on to another cephalopod that people probably are both very familiar with, but at the same time not very familiar with, Incotuthis, which, well, many people may know the genus Tusatuthis, which has most times been synonymized with Incotuthis. And yeah, this animal was still pretty big, especially for a cephalopod. Compared to some of the other estimates that we've gotten, like the larger sizes, like this is not very big compared to them, but still for its own right, it still was around six feet long or even longer. Again, it kind of depends on how you reconstruct the animal since we don't know much about it since, again, cephalopods do not fossilize well. But this animal also lived during the late Cretaceous, most likely in the Western Interior Seaway and other parts of the ocean around North America. And, well, again, it would have also been a carnivore, probably feeding on smaller marine reptiles, fish, and other smaller cephalopods. Moving on to the last of the cephalopods, we have... Yezotuthis and Harborotuthis. Most scientists do consider Yezotuthis the larger of the two, though it is kind of difficult to say since both these animals are, well, only known from beaks, and again, since they both lived in the same time and place, it, they, your fossils do get kind of mixed up. And again, Yezotuthis and Harborotuthis would have lived during, uh, somewhat during the um, later part of the Cretaceous period in Japan. And again, these guys would have also been carnivores using their beaks to crush prey, especially these ones since they seem to have had beaks that were larger, well, at least twice the size of beaks of giant and colossal squids from our current time. And scientists have suggested that, of course, just because their beaks were twice the size, they may not have been twice the size of the animal, though, hey, you never know. It could definitely still be a possibility, though most estimates do put them closer to just being similar in size to colossal and giant squids, though they are definitely one of the largest, if not the largest, um, cephalopod without a shell that we know of from prehistory, for sure. Though there are a few other giant cephalopods, including ones that may, including fossils that may belong to Yezotuthis or Harborotuthis, though scientists are not 100% sure if it belonged to one of these two. And then there's also, of course, the Triassic Kraken, which people may have heard of, heard of though um, most scientists just kind of don't talk about those since they're very unlikely to belong to a giant cephalopod. Though, again, some people still do have their doubts, though definitely would not really consider it, though just did want to bring it up. Of course, Yezotuthis, Harborotuthis were probably the largest shellless one, and of course, Endoceros and Camaroceros and Paleoproasa was probably the largest shelled um, cephalopod. Now, we move on to the next segment, the fish. We're finally done with the invertebrates.